Good morning, everyone. I am Lisa Lord from the Public Affairs Department, and today we will have a virtual media briefing. We will be addressed by Minister of Education, Technological and Vocational Training, the Honorable Santia Bradshaw, on the reopening of schools, which was initially scheduled for next week. And we will also hear from the Executive Director of the Caribbean Disaster Emergency Management Agency, or SEDEMA, Ms. Elizabeth Riley, on relief efforts for the people of St. Vincent and the Grenadines as the island continues to struggle with the effects of the Lasso Frey volcano. We will first hear from Minister Bradshaw. Thank you so much, Lisa. Good morning, fellow Barbadians and members of the media. As many of you are no doubt aware, the third term of the school year was scheduled to commence on Monday the 19th of April for teachers and on Tuesday the 20th of April for students at all public schools. We would have been welcoming back into the physical plant for the first time since the end of term one, all class three and four students at the primary schools and all form five and six at the secondary level. Phased approaches were planned for special needs as well as in nursery schools, and then all other year groups would have been attending school using the blended approach, which would include some online days and some days of face-to-face. -face. It is fair to say that all stakeholders as of Friday last week were looking forward to finalizing plans for the phased reopening of school face-to-face -face during this current week. Amongst those preparations would have included the continuation of the vaccination program, which would have seen a number of our teachers, education stakeholders being vaccinated to date. We have over 2,500 persons having been vaccinated. We also had intended refresher training for the safety monitors, those persons who would have been assisting in the school to make sure that the students followed the relevant health and safety protocols. Um, we've had to cancel that as of Monday. We were also looking forward this week to handing over the supplies um, from PAHO um, to a number of our, our special schools because we recognized even at the end of last term that we wanted to make sure that those schools had all of these special sanitizing materials and um, certainly creating safe spaces for our special needs students. That regrettably has also had to be canceled. The Education Technical Management Unit, or principals, education officers, health and safety committees, all of the ancillary staffs have all been busy assessing the readiness of the school plants and would have been making last minute changes and recommendations to the ministry. We were in the process of putting down the floor markings, um, which would have seen students three feet apart in classrooms so that we would be able to get more students in. And across the plants, minor works were being done in terms of plumbing, in terms of our water tanks having been cleaned, the water heaters being serviced, BC units, um, the entire gambit of, of things that prepare us for the school plan. Um, I had also a few tours that were planned um, of some of the schools that many of you would have um, brought to the attention of the public in relation to Lawrence T. Gase and George Primary. We were looking to basically um, show the country uh, what we had done over the course of this down period in trying to prepare the plan for the readiness of both teachers and students. And we have additional works that will be planned and hope that we can get to certainly um, show the, the country what we have been able to do at the schools because it was really long overdue. With the assistance of the National Conservation Con Commission and certainly private contractors, we've been cleaning obviously the playing fields, um, making sure that all the gutters were clear, um, tidying up the general surroundings of the plant and the janitors would have been in the schools um, preparing in terms of sanitization and carrying out all of the um, necessary um, protocols that were necessary to prepare for the school environment. Um, this week, our school canteens were mobilizing, getting themselves ready. Um, our school meals department was also readying itself to make sure that we could welcome students back in. And in terms of transportation, we were in the process as well of making sure that we were able to um, identify the number of students who would be coming back to the school plant so that the transport board would assist us with making sure that those students would be able to, um, to, to get to the school as easily as possible. I say all this to say that all stakeholders were moving full steam ahead um, to ensure that students and teachers were able to return safely to the school environment face to face. In the same way that households and other government departments, the private entities have been assessing the impact of the ongoing volcanic eruptions of the Masofura volcano and the subsequent ash fall across Barbados. The Ministry of Education, its Education Technical Management Unit, our principals, chairman of the boards of management and other ministry officials 
have also been carrying out their own assessment of our school plans over the last few days. Our findings have revealed that there are blankets of ash covering every building and every corridor. There is ash which has entered the classroom through in particular the breeze blocks for many of you we may not realize but a lot of the schools based on um, a number of years ago in terms of construction um, they have the ventilation blocks that would have allowed for, for better ventilation within the schools. As a consequence, um, the classrooms would not have been protected. So you have a lot of the ash having blown into the classrooms. And truthfully, where there may have been a broken window pane or even a louver window, um, the ash has entered into the classroom. And of, of course, that now has to be cleaned thoroughly. We've also realized that the guttering and the down pipes um, have also been impacted. And in some cases, they're gonna to have to be cleaned, but also disconnected as well to prevent, especially if there's further um, ash fall, they're going to have to obviously um, prepare for that as well. No school has been spared from the impact of the ash, just as no household across Barbados has been spared. Uh, we have responsibility for over 105 schools that range ranging from nursery to tertiary. Um, and therefore, over the course of the last few days, we have made a determination that we have obviously to take certain action to get the school plans ready to return students and teachers to the classroom environment. So far, the ancillary staff have started to clean up where they can on the inside and on the outside of the buildings, um, but we recognize that more technical assistance is going to be needed to assist them in reaching difficult areas and difficult spaces to carry out the in-depth cleaning. As you can appreciate, we have multi-story buildings. It is not that straightforward to just, you know, use one ladder to be able to, to reach the um, guttering. And therefore, we will have to have persons who may have um, the appropriate equipment to be able to assist them in clearing the guttering. Uh, we also recognize that we're going to need the professional cleaning services and other technical staff to be able to assess the AC units. The PVC panels, uh, well, there are a number of photovoltaic panels at a number of our school buildings. We also have the water tanks, which we're in the process of being cleaned, but again, those will also need to be checked as well. We've got the generators that we would have installed during the Hurricane Preparedness Program. Those are also having to be um, inspected by the relevant professionals. And of course, the issue of clearing the gutters and properly disposing of the ash um, will require its own specialist teams to do that as well. We have so far secured additional PPE equipment, um, you know, ensuring that we have the protective covering, the masks, the face shields, goggles for the staff, especially those who will be working in the external environment. Um, we're also paying particular attention to schools where prior to all of this, may have only had one janitor um, and perhaps in some cases no dedicated general worker, and therefore they will be given specific attention as well. We've also put together a series of protocols for the cleaning firms um, because, you know, in this environment, everybody now wants to be to come forward to say that they're a professional cleaner. But we do have some very clear guidelines in terms of how we propose to dispose, obviously, of the ash. Um, and it is not just I don't think for us it's a responsibility only for getting the ash cleared from the school premises. But we have to make sure in working with the cleaning companies that they also dispose of the ash after it leaves the Ministry of Education's premises across the various school plants. And so we have those protocols in place, which will be shared with um, both the principals as well as the, the persons who will be engaged to assist us. The monitoring of this exercise will be done by the ETN unit, as well as our building maintenance officers um, in the ministry simply to ensure that there is compliance with the protocols. We do not want any shortcuts as it relates to the cleaning and the sanitizing of these premises, whether on the inside or the outside. Therefore, in light of the extent and the nature of the works, which are now going to have to be undertaken across the school plants, I want to advise that for term three, um, this will now commence for all public nursery, primary and secondary schools on Monday, the 26th of April. The commencement of all online classes will also be, laid, be delayed by one week. Private schools, as you know, um, take their guidance usually from the ministry in respect of when we start our term, but we also appreciate that they too will have to determine their state of readiness and they will advise the Ministry of Education accordingly. As it relates to CXEs, um, as you know, we, we would have prepared for students going back in who would have been doing examinations and in particular practical examinations and SVAs. Um, the labs are obviously, you know, filled with ash at this point in time. And so we have taken the position that none of the SVAs or the practicals will be completed or conducted until the cleaning has been done at the respective schools. 
As I speak to you this morning, there's also a council meeting ongoing with the registrar for Barbados and other registrars to discuss with CXC, obviously, what has been transpiring with Barbados and certainly St. Vincent and other affected islands to be able to look at how we can cater for our students um, who have been affected um, by this exercise. And therefore, I suspect that within the course of the next few hours or certainly next few days, um, those students will hear um, further details in relation to plans in relation to their practical examinations. Um, with respect to tertiary institutions, they, both the Barbados Vocational Training Board and SJPA have both delayed for a week as well. There will be no classes face-to-face -face or online for those two institutions. The Barbados Community College, um, they have already started extensive cleanup there. Um, they are planning for students at a hospitality institution, um, institute, sorry, because they are smaller numbers and they want to be able to allow them to return face-to-face -face once the all clear is given from Monday the 19th of April. Students doing the practical components at the BCC are scheduled to return to the Erie campus on the 26th of April. Those will include students involved in the health sciences, physical education, general education, technology, fine arts and commerce. All other classes will continue online at this point in time. The Erdison Teachers Training College and the University of the West Indies, um, both classes will come, continue online. I believe University of the West Indies at this point is um, in the middle of examination, so they are not as affected in terms of students returning face-to-face -face at this point. Um, but again, in both situations, the cleaning is continue, continuing at the campus, um, and wherever possible, the, the facilitation for online classes will continue in this environment. Let me just say as well to, to the public that during this period, as we pre prepare to go back into the school environment, we recognize that the mental health and wellness of our teachers was of paramount importance and certainly also of our students. And therefore, um, I would have said on the last occasion when I spoke about returning to the classroom environment, that it was our intention to establish a health and wellness um, committee. Um, I can um, update the country that we have, in fact, started to create a framework for that committee. Um, tomorrow at Cabinet, we'll be taking the paper to be able to get the sign off in relation to its composition. And then we will be in a, in a position to start working um, on ensuring that all of our stakeholders um, are better equipped to deal with mental health and wellness issues, but also that this forms part of a wider approach that we will take going forward, even within the wider curriculum, to be able to ensure that our students understand how to deal with these types of eventualities when they arise. Um, before I close, um, let me just say that my prayers are with my brothers and sisters in St. Vincent. Um, I've spent a lot of years working in the territory. Um, I used to manage on Skinny Fabulous, um, one of the popular soca artists. Um, and I've had the extension of kindness from the people of St. Vincent. Um, I cannot even begin to imagine what they're going through. Um, but I want to give the assurance that not only is the government committed to assisting in any way that they can with the, the outfall from this particular incident, but certainly wherever the Ministry of Education can assist its um, brother ministry there in, in St. Vincent, and certainly any of the students, um, so long as we um, have the ability to assist in taking in students or in helping in any way, um, you know, we are prepared to do so. And I just want that, you know, Barbadians continue to pray um, for the persons who have been affected and certainly for the families here as well who have persons affected by this particular experience. Um, Lisa, that's it for me. I'm prepared to, I'm willing to answer any questions if I say that. And thank you, Minister. Before we go to questions, Ms. Riley from Sadima will now speak to relief efforts for the people of St. Vincent and the Grenadines. Ms. Riley? Thank you very much, Lisa, and good morning to the media, not just here in Barbados, but across the other 18 Sedema participating states who are joining us for the briefing. I want to, of course, start by expressing Sedema's solidarity with the government and people of St. Vincent and the Grenadines at this time. And I want to also express a special thanks to the government of Barbados, which is the sub-regional focal point for the sub-region where St. Vincent and the Grenadines lies. Specific thanks to Ms. Hines and her team at the Department of Emergency Management. I also want to acknowledge the national disaster coordinators of our other participating states who have been doing their best to coordinate the relief efforts as well. And finally, just to the CIDIMA coordinating unit team, I absolutely want to recognize the very hard work that they have been doing since 
December of last year in support in St. Vincent and the Grenadines. So the updates as at 9 a.m. As you know, as a result of the explosive eruption on April the 9th, there are approximately 20,000 persons who were displaced in St. Vincent. As at 9 a.m. this morning, there are 87 public shelters that are open, housing 3,984 shelteries. In addition, as you can well imagine, there are a number of persons who have opted to shelter with friends and family, and the Emergency Operations Center is in the process of collating the statistics on those numbers and their geographical locations. This morning, the registration tallied 2,048 persons who are housed with 446 families, but as I indicated, this process is ongoing. I want to say a little bit about what Sedima has been doing since our last update over the weekend. And at the request of the government of St. Vincent and the Grenadines, we have mobilized a detailed damage sector assessment team, which is going into St. Vincent and the Grenadines today. And the intent of that team is to support the government in providing a, an assessment or snapshot of where certain key sectors are at this stage. And we want to thank the regional agencies, including CARFA and CARDI, who readily agreed to provide persons to support these teams, as well as our international partners, uh, such as the FAO and PAHO, who are also participating in this assessment and other entities like CARLEC. Of course, this team is being led by the SEDEMA coordinating unit. And within four days, we anticipate having a fairly consolidated picture with respect to the state of affairs and also to get a deeper understanding of the needs as they're evolving. In addition, the coordinating unit will be deploying its CARICOM disaster relief unit this is a team which is coordinated through the regional security system, one of our very close partners, and will provide support in the relief management operations at the national level, principally at the seaport. And we want to thank the RSS for its support. I also want to recognize the resource mobilization efforts to date in support of the coordinating unit which is around 400,000 US dollars and to thank the development partners who have readily come to our assistance since December. These include USAID, the Government of Romania, United Kingdom Foreign Commonwealth Development Office and also Global Affairs Canada. So to speak a little bit about the relief efforts, I'll touch on that briefly. Um, we have been mobilizing relief, including from our sub-regional warehouse here in Barbados, and also across the participating states through very coordinated efforts uh, of our national disaster offices. From our sub-regional warehouse, we have deployed a quantity of items, um, including uh, uh, equipment to support the supply of water, so those include uh, jerry cans, um, collapsible uh, water bladders. We've deployed in collaboration with UNICEF a large quantity of uh, dignity kits and wash kits. We've also mobilized in excess of a thousand military cots from our sub-regional warehouses and also through donations by the Barbados Defense Force and CARICOM Impacts and a large quantity of bottled water. As you recognize, the process is very much ongoing and we're in the process of doing the tallying and the information is coming in incredibly quickly. So we hope to have some concrete statistics on what has actually reached country within another day or so that we can share with the media. I want to say a special thanks to the general public and also to the private sector of the Sedima participating states who have really rallied around the government and the people of St. Vincent and the Grenadines at this time. And to thank you for your extreme generosity, it is deeply appreciated. And based on the brief by the Seismic Research Center, I think we all recognize that this is an eruption which can be going for some time. They've indicated it could be weeks or it could be months. And what is important with respect to understanding the needs is that the needs are going to change over time. 
So what has come out was an initial needs list. And when we have the assessment completed in another four days or so, we will see further revisions of those needs lists. And we ask the public to remain um, plugged in to um, those changing needs and how you can best re respond to assist. I, I want to, however, urge you to coordinate with your national disaster offices. And I'm speaking to the public across the Caribbean. It is very important that you do this because one of the functions of SEDEMA, as you can well appreciate, is to try to assist and work with countries on the coordination. And it's really important for the receiving state. As you can imagine, their lives have been very much disrupted um, by what has happened. Many of the persons who are working in emergency services and coordinating have been personally affected as well. And given the level of pressure that they're under, we absolutely don't want to create another layer of a challenge for them to be sending relief, which is outside of the coordination mechanisms. So I really urge you, I know there are many entities that are absolutely well-meaning, um, but please stay in touch with your national disaster offices, ensure that the work that you're doing is consistent with the needs list that has been issued. Uh, we, we are discouraging unsolicited items um, from the needs list because we don't want to create a secondary disaster by overloading the country with items which are not prioritized at this time. As I said, the needs list will change over time and this is something that should be tracked and coordinated through your disaster office. I also just want to touch on a couple of other things, Lisa, if you don't mind. One is related to independent vessels, uh, which have been sailing to St. Vincent and the Grenadines. And whilst we appreciate the, the intent um, of what you want to do, recognize that the port at this time is very important in the supply chain. The airport in St. Vincent and the Grenadines is in fact closed. So this is the point of entry into country. And we need to make sure that this point of entry is accessible uh, to the relief items which are coming in, which have been sanctioned by the government. And we know that you're well-intentioned, but it can cause a level of congestion as well at the port. And we absolutely don't want this to happen. So if you're thinking of providing relief items, please have a conversation with your national disaster coordinators. We have mechanisms in place through our memorandum of understanding with different uh, companies, including tropical shipping, and we're facilitating the movements, the logistics of the movement of relief items from the state. So please coordinate with your disaster offices. The other message I wanted to send is that financial resources are also being encouraged by the government of St. Vincent and the Grenadines. And I think this is a really important point because remember that the, the supply chain to country has not been broken. In other words, ships are still coming in, they're restocking um, supermarkets. Uh, we do have some limited opening of supermarkets at this time and keeping the economy going in country is equally important. So we're encouraging you that if this is an option for you, you can provide financial resources. The government of St. Vincent and the Grenadines has provided an official uh, bank account to which the deposits can be made. And they've also asked Sedema to provide bank accounts, which we have. Uh, we have a Barbados dollar account for use here in Barbados by persons who may wish to do so. And we also have a US dollar account for persons who are within the diaspora or just want to assist. These are all available via the Sedema website and you can feel free to access them as well. So I think those are the major things, um, except to say that Colleagues, the hurricane season is upcoming. And bear in mind that the, the first uh, forecast from Colorado State University is indicating an above average season, but remember it takes just one. Uh, we have 17 named storms estimated right now with eight hurricanes and four major hurricanes. So please bear this in mind. This is gonna bring another le level of complexity to our colleagues in St. Vincent and the Grenadines. And of course, we'll continue to support them as best we can. So thanks very much, Lisa, and I'm available to answer any questions. 
Thank you so much, Ms. Riley. We will now open for questions and joining us from the media are Tonisha rock from Starcom Network, Barry Allen from The Nation Newspaper, Kerry Gooding from Loop, Ryan Broom from CBC, and Randy Bennett from Barbados today. Your questions? Uh, good morning, Minister Barry Allen from The Nation Newspaper. Um, going back to what you said earlier, what you guys are planning obviously seems to be a, a massive undertaking. So I wanted to know from a human resource perspective, how many more people is the Ministry of Education in a position to actually bring on to help with this cleanup over the, over the next couple of weeks? Well, I think first of all, Barry, we have um, obviously ancillary workers um, at the schools that will do the usual cleaning and preparation for school. Um, but like I said before, this requires a, a more technical set of um, expertise to be able to help with, with, with more hands, basically, trying to help move all of the ash from the school premises. Um, what we're doing is looking at the various companies that would assist the ministry generally to clean. Um, there are a number of industrial cleaners that work with the Ministry of Education from time to time. There are a number of businesses that would have been created within the last couple of months as well to do cleaning. And therefore, we're working with the various um, contractors to assist us in helping with the cleanup efforts. So to give a precise number would be a little bit difficult at this point. Um, but we are subcontracting persons to assist us with the general works across the schools. Good morning, Minister Tanisha Rockyall here, Starcom Network. Given the changes that you mentioned, what are the implications for the 11 plus exam? How will it be dealt with? And any consideration, would any consideration be given to adjusting the final grades? I think at this stage, it's still a little bit too early for me to pronounce on the common entrance examination. Um, you know, again, a week ago, we were in preparation to bring children back face to face. Um, that is what was desired by teachers, that is what was desired by students, by the, the parents, um, to have the opportunity to do face-to-face. -face. We said before we would try to do the assessments in the first weeks or so, so that we knew where our children were, so that, and, and that our decisions were informed by the mental health and wellness of, of children in particular, and then being able to make a decision on an examination. I think I'm on record as making it clear the examination is not going to define these children's lives, but what we do in terms of how we handle their ability to deal with the anxiety surrounding um, COVID and now obviously ash. Um, I think as adults, we have to pay attention to what is happening. Um, as an adult, I find it particularly difficult to make this transition from COVID, uh, you know, just as we're getting ready to come onto this and then we're trying to deal with dust everywhere, cleaning, uh, we can't go outside. Um, you know, I joked and say to others, I, I started getting into the garden a lot more. I can't even go outside. Now imagine how it is for a child who normally, even during COVID, COVID would be able to go around the perimeter of this, the, the household. Now they can't even go outside. So I think, you know, getting ready for an exam, I think for most children at this point in time is the farthest thing from their minds. I think we just need to get the country back to a level of normalcy. And so long as we're able to um, overcome this period, um, I give the assurance we'll make some decisions very quickly and announce to the public what we will do as far as common entrance, but generally in relation to um, online and certainly in relation to the future for a number of our students. Thank you. And secondly, what does the contingency plan look like if there are continued eruptions and heavy ashfall? Well, th that's a challenging question. Um, you know, someone was messaging me just now to say that um, we didn't mention specifically um, what will happen if we're not ready in terms of cleaning by the 26th. And the reality is I don't think we can give any certainty in terms of what will happen. We're going to use best efforts over the course of the next couple of days to make sure that we get the school plants ready. We know that it's going to be um, the impact in terms of whether we can actually get back to school in a physical way is going to be pretty much determined by what happens in terms of ash fall. I think we all know that. Um, but we have to make the effort. And I think throughout this entire the pandemic, certainly we've shown that, you know, Barbados resilience is such that we try to still fight against whatever is happening and to at least keep that sanity that I think is important. So we, we will prepare um, for the best case scenario, but we will continue to have the contingencies just in case. Um, as I said before, it is difficult to teach and, and, and certainly to 
um, operate in an environment where all the windows are closed. Um, and I think we have to bear that in mind. Um, so I think there are some further considerations that are going to have to be made if there is additional um, ash fall, but we'd still have the online as a backup and we may have to make some adjust adjustments to the amount of time, maybe if people are teaching that they would actually teach online. Maybe the city an interaction is still necessary with students, but it may not be for the length of time um, that in normal school, they would have been operating in the online environment over the course of the last couple of weeks. But adjustments will be made as necessary. Tanisha. Thank you. Okay. Questions, Kerry, getting from Outlook News. One question for Minister Bradshaw, which would be, I know you're going back to Parliament with regards to the Health and Wellness Committee. Will you need a supplementary in terms of covering the cost of the cleaning with the different experts? And yeah. then the question for Sedima would be, some persons are concerned that donations are not reaching the people that they need to reach. Can you speak to this as well? Okay, thanks, Kerry, for the question. Um, we It's actually cabinet that it goes to. It's really just to simply outline the framework under which we'll be operating, making sure that um, all of cabinet has the opportunity to weigh in on the persons that we are proposing to place on the committee. Um, we've already started our discussions with UNICEF, for instance, and they're working with us to help to train teachers over the coming weeks. Um, and that will probably continue online regardless of whatever happens in terms of face-to-face -face or continuing online. Um, as it relates to cost, um, just like everything else, um, I think at this point, we, we can't say with certainly what the overall cost will be in terms of budget for cleaning schools. I certainly have had the experience of having to clean schools um, and industrially clean schools prior to the start of school when they were closed for the entire summer. Um, so I know it's not going to be you know, a minor cost that we're talking about. And the nature of the cleaning is obviously, you know, going to be quite, um, you know, high in terms of dealing with this. But I do feel that the cost of doing this is perhaps better than doing nothing at all at this point. So at the appropriate time, yes, we'll probably have to get a supplementary. But right now, we're just pretty much getting all the quotations and putting everything together. So we can't wait on that to, to then decide that we're going to clean, as you can appreciate. Ryan? And the second part of the question is Sedima. Okay, I'm sorry, uh, thank, thank you so much for the question. And it's, it's a very good question and it really import, reiterates the importance of the centralized coordination. At this time, consignments into country for the general population should be done through the National Emergency Management Organization in St. Vincent and the Grenadines. And why this is important is that, as you know, the national system is coordinated. The welfare and social uh, welfare related departments are plugged into the National Emergency Operations Center. As I mentioned, they're going through the process of identifying the persons who are located with friends and family. Well, the reason why that is being done is that there's a recognition that support has to be provided not only to the persons within the shelters, the 87 shelters that I mentioned, but also persons who are housed with friends and family, because as you would appreciate, there is then an additional uh, call upon those families to provide for the persons who are staying with them. And the government fully recognizes the requirement to provide some support in that regard. So the coordination is really key. Once you stick within the coordination mechanisms, the contributions and donations will get to the persons who, to who, to, to the persons who are most in need. I just wanted to add one other point. The prime minister has been very clear in his press conferences that at this time, receipt of items for individuals is not encouraged because right now the country is looking at the receipt of bulk donations, which will then be packaged and distributed to those in need. Thanks very much. Thank you. And Ryan, I think you had a question. A question from Ms. Riley. I heard the Prime Minister, Dr. Ralph Gonzalez this morning was talking about having some security issues. How do those things play? I know he mentioned things that they, they were monitoring a situation where people were actually trying to, to get into people's homes who were evacuated and that kind of thing. How are you, how are you dealing with security issues from Sedima's end? Okay, thanks 
to the question, the security issues within the regional response mechanism are coordinated through the regional security system. And there's an ongoing dialogue. In fact, since December, we have been coordinating with the RSS through their executive director, Captain Sherland, and he remains in very close contact with the chief of police in St. Vincent and the Grenadines. Um, any security related issues are escalated to that level and any requirements for surge support to assist the police uh, force on the ground will be channeled through the RSS. They do the coordination and we work together on the logistics to get that into country. Thank you. And a question for you, Minister Bradshaw. Um, seeing that Professor Robertson had predicted that Barbados could be dealing with ash fall for days, weeks, or even months. Uh, my question to you is, is there currently an emergency protocol in place or do you plan to establish one? If students are in class and we do get news that um, there will be an ash fall event. Mm -hmm. I, my understanding from UNICEF and, and certainly the work that's been done with the ministry over the last couple of years is that we do have protocols for evacuation of the schools um, for natural disasters. I, I don't know that ash fall um, would have been in the contemplation back then. Certainly it would have been more um, earthquakes. It would have been, you know, what to do at the, if you get an earthquake. Um, and Sadima can speak to this as well. I, I think it would have been more in terms of um, water damage and stuff like that in the schools. Um, but I think the similar principles still apply in terms of what to do obviously with ashfall you're going to have to make sure that windows are closed um and so i think the, the necessary protocols will be, be, be put in place um in the event that children are in the classroom uh, but i think from this whole experience um i think it is fair to say that once they are in the school um the ventilation becomes an issue obviously if you if the children are in the classroom for any protracted period of time and that is why we are concerned Obviously, if there is continuous ash fall and we are able to return to the school environment, what will happen in the event that children are in that environment? Equally, we can't do nothing. And so we have to prepare um, for every eventuality in the event that it happens and just have the necessary evacuation plans in place to be able to do it at this point in time. But there's nothing that we can say in terms of certainty, um, Barry. But a follow-up question to that quickly, Minister. <laughs> to, your, to your knowledge, uh, are you aware of any percentage of our teacher complement being trained in evacuation processes? There are health and safety committees at the various schools. Um, there's been a thrust in the last few months to try to get more and more established and fully functioning. A number of training sessions would have been done by UNICEF as well. And I think we have a lot of professionals within the system who themselves are interested in disaster management. Um, and certainly in the evacuation procedures. Uh, we just concluded a session with the Caribbean Schools Initiative, uh, where again, we were looking at the safety of buildings, looking at being able to train teachers. Um, Barbados is not a signatory, but we certainly support and have signed on and bought into a number of the things that um, have been you know, indicated to us that we must do. Um, the intention is to sign on at the appropriate time, um, but I, I know we've been working very closely with Sedema as well to be able to look at um, training and certainly to be able to look at the plant generally um, and certainly to put those things in place. So training um, in these areas definitely going forward is something not just for the teachers, um, but certainly a better understanding by students as to how to respond in this type of environment um, is becoming more and more apparent that we need to do it. Uh, Minister Bradshaw, I know the pivot before the volcano was to try to get back to, to in-person as quickly as possible, but where were we in terms of the devices? Is that something that is still being pursued, notwithstanding the fact that it is the desire is to get back to in-person classes? Yeah, all of the devices that we had um, procured, um, both on island and the ones that were due to come in, all of those are actually on island and distribution has been continuing. Again, I probably missed out that earlier in my um, presentation as to how we were preparing, but the devices certainly have been being deployed. I think the nursery schools um, would have gotten some of their devices. Teachers would have been accessing devices. So again, this week would have, con have, would have been the continuation of that rollout plan. And uh, as we would have anticipated, you know, once children go back into a face-to-face, -face, 
the demand for the devices obviously lessens because they are doing face-to-face. -face. Um, but we recognize that technology is going to play a large part going forward, um, you know, because we, we don't know what to expect going forward and we may have to use the online environment um, obviously a lot more. So we've been training teachers in how to make that transition, um, incorporating technology into pedagogy, trying to make sure that we have enough devices for these specialized subjects as well, specific devices for those with AutoCAD, um, and just trying to make that general transition so that we prepare um, all stakeholders um, you know, a bit better than perhaps they may have been prepared before. Um, Erdison is doing a, a really good job now. We've integrated them more into teacher training, and um, we're doing some projects with the IDB um, as well, trying to make sure that as we get more technology into the schools, that we're also able to make sure that teachers are comfortable using the online platform. And Minister Tanisha here, how would you describe the support from the two teachers unions for the changes that you have announced today? It was um, quite heartwarming to hear the um, response from all of them. Um, and I certainly commented that it was like, the amount of support that we got yesterday um, was quite unlike any other meeting that I've held. Um, I, I think generally there's a sense that we have been trying to get students back in face-to-face -face, um, and with all the best intentions, this incident has now taken place, uh, which has pretty much set us back. So even if there were reservations about going back to face-to-face, -to -face, I think for the most part, um, after all the noise was over, everybody settled down and started to work with the Ministry of Education on the protocols um, and the general oversight of what was transpiring to get students and teachers back to school on the 19th. Um, I think the understanding of the ministry um, and certainly all of us is that, you know, this is not an environment that's going to be easy to teach in and it's not going to be an environment to learn in. I, I think we're all collectively agreed that face-to-face -face is better. And whether it's an issue of vaccinations um, or whether it's now an issue of dust and environmental issues, um, the sooner that we can bring a resolution to this in the interest of all parties is really in the best interest of, of education. So overall, I, I, I would say I was heartened by the support um, for the additional week, certainly to give us time to clean um, with the understanding that if we have to take further steps, we'll come back and we'll consult um, and just engage with everyone at, at every opportunity. Um, but, you know, I continue to make the point that regardless of what happens in terms of going back face to face, there are some big items that we need to work together on in terms of continuing professional development, teacher reform, um, teacher training. And, and so we are not stopping um, even things to do with the, the, the skills, technical and vocational skills. We've got meetings coming up on those to look deeper at how we integrate that more um, into the psyche of, of education and, and, and all stakeholders. Um, so we are not stopping in terms of our conversation with unions and their inclusion. Um, and I don't think that they're stopping in terms of their discussions with us as well. But, you know, again, we will just continue to consult with them and include them at every opportunity that we can. Uh, Minister, uh, has the length of this term been affected? Is it going to be shortened or lengthened or not affected? I, I don't have that crystal ball at this point, Barry. Um, I'm going to simply reiterate to, to all of you and to the country, um, give us till the 26th. Um, obviously, before the 26th, we will have, over the next couple of days, rather, we will be able to know how things are taking shape. Um, and I will get an idea, I think, from the seismologists as to where we stand in terms of the ash and how to prepare. Um, but to say, you know, two days after an assessment that we can say with full certainty, certainty how things are going to look and how we can plan, um, I think it would be a little difficult for most people to be able to do so. We, we are planning for A, and planning for B, C and D, um, but at the same time, you know, it, it, it is difficult to do so in an environment where there's so many variables. Uh, we will clean today and there could be an ash fall just the day before we open and we'll have to be prepared to make that adjustment. So people just have to be a bit more flexible than I think they ever have been. And to appreciate that this government isn't sitting down and waiting um, to see what happens. We're cleaning because we know that's, that's who we are. Um, we get up and we do what we have to do. And we're encouraging people to get around their houses clean, um, cleaning ministries, cleaning the schools, cleaning the churches, you know, just get out there and clean. It might happen again or it might not. But we have to simply, as Sadima and all the others would tell us, we've got to be prepared for all eventualities right now. And then let me just say that after this is the hurricane season. So in our planning, 
Um, we're also looking at our schools as institutions, which would also be shelters. Um, and that for us is a major concern, making sure that the, the, all of the things that, for instance, ash can come in through a window, um, but we've been prepared for water damage more so than we've been prepared for dust. Um, so now we have to look at things like breeze blocks and should we start to phase out some of those things? Should we start to redesign schools in a different way um, to accommodate for both ash fall as well as rainfall? Um, those are all considerations on the table. And as I said, we're, we're not stopping simply because there's ash falling outside. Um, after this, there must be, a, 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 it must be education. So we won't stop. Minister Bradshaw, I just have one last question as it relates to teachers and the vaccinations. I know it would have been disrupted mm -hmm. because of the ash fall and you've also had the break in between, but how many more teachers are to be vaccinated and how much is because of reluctance versus disruption? Well, let me just tell you that some of the teachers already had been vaccinated before we started this exercise um, that we have been discovering. Um, and obviously some of them might have been on the chronic in the category where they have chronic illnesses. So they had access, whether through the, the, the polyclinics or, or other ways to be able to have the vaccinations. Um, the 2,500 includes the educators. Um, just to give you a precise number, I really can't at this point in time. Suffice to say that we have tried to include all of the ancillary staff, the teachers, um, all of the people who will interface with, with students within the school environment and, and to give as much protection as possible and comfort to people once they have to interface with children at schools. Are there any further questions? Well, if there are no more questions, moments ago I received a note from the Caribbean Broadcasting Corporation. CBC will launch a national appeal to assist our brothers and sisters in St. Vincent who have been badly affected by the eruption of the Lasso Fair volcano. And details of the initiative called Help SVG will be announced shortly, but essentially it would allow Barbadians to drive to CBC and drop off the necessary items that will be boxed and sent to St. Vincent. And CBC has made it clear they will be working with the relevant government agencies and more details on help SVG will come on TV8 and CBC's presentations. At this time, let me thank Minister of Education, Technological and Vocational Training, the Honorable Santia Bradshaw, who spoke on the delayed reopening of schools and indeed the cleanup of the institutions. We also heard from the Executive Director of the Caribbean Disaster Emergency Management Agency, or SEDEMA, Ms. Elizabeth Riley, on relief efforts for the people of St. Vincent and the Grenadines. Thank you, members of the media, and you at home for joining us. Good afternoon.